Hello and welcome to the Connecting Africa Digital Week, brought to you in association with the 20th anniversary of AfricaCom, the biggest gathering of tech and telecommunications enthusiasts on the African continent. It's taken place in Cape Town between the 7th and the 9th of November at the CTICC. In this Digital Week webinar, we're taking a look at fintech, Bitcoin, and the future of banking in Africa. And we're very pleased to be joined today by Lauren Gamaroff, founder and CEO of Banky Moon. As South Africa's foremost blockchain expert, Lauren has been invited around the world to speak on digital currencies and distributed ledgers and their benefits for emerging economies. He has addressed the IMF, the World Bank, FBI, the Commonwealth Secretariat, and the South African Reserve Bank, as well as presenting on TEDx. He offers insights and guidance to business executives and advises governments on blockchain technologies and their implications. He is founder and CEO of Banky Moon, a blockchain and cryptocurrency consultancy, and co-founder and CEO of Centbee, a cryptocurrency payments and remittance company. He co-founded the Blockchain Academy, which educates professionals on all aspects of blockchains from regulation to software development. Thank you so much for joining us today, Laurie, and it's great to have you with us. Thank you, Amy. It's a pleasure to be here. All right. So um, thank you very much for attending this webcast. Uh, what I'd like to do is uh, give you a, a unique insight on t into uh, uh, Bitcoin and blockchain and, and uh, how it's impacting Africa as a whole. Um, so what I want to do is take you through some context, uh, give you some ideas, uh, tell you how, what the state of the financial system is uh, in, on a global context and also uh, what the impact is going to be going forward. So uh, in uh, October 2015, this remarkable article came out uh, on, on The Economist, and The Economist, and it uh, spoke about this technology that they said was going to be the most important invention since the internet. And so, of course, many corporates and governments and uh, business people took note uh, because this idea of a decentralized currency uh, that didn't require a central bank or an authority to govern and to issue it uh, is a completely strange concept uh, considering where we've been in terms of money. And uh, there's been no end to uh, all the hype that's been going around the technology that underpins it, the blockchain, with quotes like from uh, the World Economic Forum saying it's going to become the beating heart of the global financial system. And uh, the Bank of England saying that it's a significant innovation that will have far-reaching implications. And so on and so on. Uh, with Goldman Sachs, especially nowadays, uh, having quite a strong opinion on the value of Bitcoin itself and where it's potentially going to go. Uh, uh, there's a Bitcoin meme with Bitcoin, you know, the price perhaps going to the moon. And if you weren't uh, convinced at this point, then uh, even old Bill Gates uh, believes that Bitcoin and the blockchain uh, is a technological Twitter force. So what I would like to do is I'd like to now take you through the process uh, of what it is what a blockchain is and what Bitcoin is. And then I'm going to talk about it, its context within a, uh, the global financial system um, and how it's going to transform financial services going on into the future. So it's not unusual uh, to have something like this. In fact, uh, there have been uh, uh, many people since 2000, uh, researchers and economists who've, who've been trying to fulfill what Milton Friedman predicted when, when he said in early 2000 that the one thing that's missing on the internet but that will soon be invented as a reliable e-cash. And what he meant was not a, a currency, a, a digital currency that was controlled by the banking system, but a digital token that could be issued uh, that acted as sound money, much like gold, and acted as cash. So now since 2002, when, this, uh, when he made this prediction, uh, researchers and developers and economists, everybody's been trying to figure this out and has and basically, there's been very little success since that time until uh, 2009 when a, a white paper came out uh, describing Bitcoin. So now, if you want to understand the how Bitcoin works, and uh, then uh, what I'd like to do is take you through the, the financial system as, as it exists today, where what we have is we have uh, a, a bank that basically will hold funds um, for a person, and uh, that person will then be able to transact but the person doesn't transact directly with that cash. They actually issued instructions to the bank to make payments. So if we now look at the, the banking system, if we were to imagine a digital cash like the one that Milton Friedman predicted, essentially it would be the situation where you have this bank and um, if somebody now wants to now go and transact with a token, 
what would happen is the bank would go and issue that token and send it to the, the customer and the customer would actually be holding that digital token. It wouldn't be sitting now at the bank. And then they would be sending over the token to the merchant. Now, this is not how a uh, digital currency works at the moment. And in fact, is not how Bitcoin works. Bitcoin works very much like the existing banking system. If you think about a bank at the moment, there is a, um, a bank will hold an account uh, or a ledger with, with accounts and balances. And um, if somebody now wants to go and transact uh, with that money at the merchant, what they in fact will do is they will now go and send um, an instruction to the bank to, to move money across to the merchant's bank account. Um, let's just bring that up here quickly. So what will happen now is the, the customer will present uh, a credit card to the merchant, but in fact what's going on in the background is a, a instruction has been sent to the bank and uh, uh, the bank will then move money to the uh, merchant's account. Now that is, uh, if you understand that process, then you're 90% of the way to understanding how a Bitcoin transaction works. What we have is we have the same sort of system where we have a ledger with accounts and balances, but in this particular situation in a blockchain, we don't actually have the, or the central authority or the, the organization which is holding that account. What happens is we have a number of volunteers around the world who are uh, basically are all going to be hosting an instance of that ledger. And that ledger is now distributed amongst all those participants. And they are all performing exactly the same function as the bank, where they are now processing transactions and they are checking each other constantly uh, to, uh, to make sure that there is no um, manipulation or corruption of that ledger. And uh, uh, this is not just within a particular uh, uh, jurisdiction, but actually what we have now is throughout the world, there are a number of these uh, systems, these volunteers that are all hosting copies of this ledger. And uh, uh, what we have at the moment is uh, with the system is something very much like the internet, a globally distributed banking system that is decentralized. There isn't a single a person or a government or organization that controls that ledger. Everybody has the, the visibility on that ledger and they are all in consensus as to what information is on that ledger. And so now for the first time in history is we have this global banking system, uh, one that can be accessed by anybody with access to the internet, um, that they where they can now move money and hold money and move it around the world um, effortlessly and uh, simply. And uh, uh, this has uh, enormous implications in terms of how people think about holding wealth and holding value. Because uh, again, there is no such thing as a jurisdiction that uh, this money or your value exists. And now uh, individuals are, have the ability to move money right across border. The, the concept of moving money across border with, in terms of Bitcoin transactions just doesn't make sense. We can now have this global financial system um, that will e could easily bring uh, financial inclusivity to many of the world's unbanked. And we know that in Africa, there are 80% of, of people don't have access to the banking uh, banking system. So why is it called a blockchain? Well, if you if you understand again, going back to the the bank ledger system. Um, if, uh, what we have is every few minutes or so, uh, there are transactions that are being broadcast to this network and they are being grouped together into what we call a block. And then uh, 10 minutes later, another group of transactions are grouped together and grouped together into another block. And that block is chained onto the previous block. And this is why we called it a blockchain. So if you understand this much about blockchains and Bitcoin, then you, you really have a, a good understanding of on what we have here. Now, um, why is it important that we have this ledger with these numbers on it? Uh, why do we think about this thing as money? And uh, if you were just uh, look into a uh, Bitcoin itself, it actually has very many of the same properties as gold. And that is why uh, pundits and uh, economists right now are, are calling Bitcoin a digital form of gold. So it, it's exactly like gold, but it has an extra property being digital and being a much better medium of exchange. Okay, so why is this important and why is it so relevant to Africa and the, the world as a whole? 
And it all comes down to this particular picture. Now, um, I was in fact born from in Zimbabwe, and uh, I remember uh, what when uh, the the Reserve Bank of Zimbabwe started printing these hundred trillion dollar notes. And uh, it became very real to everybody living in Zimbabwe that this, the money system that we have is fundamentally broken, where if you could have a, a currency that can just be hyperinflated um, by, uh, by the central bank, then it means that uh, people can't really have faith and confidence in that system. Um, this is another uh, picture, you know, $100, trillion, $100 billion for three eggs. Um, and in fact, what we have today now in Zimbabwe are um, uh, millions of what are called starving billionaires. Uh, and um, the irony now is that uh, those notes, they, they, they are worthless as a legal tender, but they do have value. And that's just from, a, from a, the point of view of a, a sentimental thing, you know, where we can look at this as a memento of how money destroys nations. So if we look at the, the supply of currency in, in Zimbabwe, we can see a very definite curve and uh, you know it's almost um, surprising that that uh, during the the last days of hyperinflation in Zimbabwe people didn't look at it, this sort of chart and this is the supply of money in Zimbabwe and since 2000 uh, just prior to back to, to 2000 realized that uh, this is happening um, couldn't they have stopped such a thing uh, will this ever happen again well, the, the funny thing is that Zimbabwe was only the, the 56th time in the last 100 years that a, a currency has hyperinflated. And there's now a 57th uh, country that is hyperinflating its currency, and that is Venezuela. And you can see that the chart looks exactly the same as it did in Zimbabwe. Uh, so what I did was when I viewed these charts, I went to go look at my own country, South Africa, to see what this, the hyperinflation looks like here. And you, can, you can't tell the difference. South Africa's money supply is also hyperinflating. So it, w the first thing we wonder is what textbooks these economists or these uh, reserve bankers are, are reading, because clearly the, this has only one outcome, and that is destruction of the financial system itself. Um, if you now go look around the world, you'll see if uh, China, uh, the chart looks almost exactly the same since 2008. Uh, we've, we, China's been going through hyperinflation. And then finally, the, the world reserve currency, the US dollar. And uh, it all started in 2008. And when we look at this and we wonder what was the event that happened in 2008, we all know that that was what was called the global financial crisis where through all the subprime loans that were given out to people who shouldn't have had them, all the banks went insolvent, and so the central bank had to bail out the, the banking system. And they did that by printing vast amounts of money. And this process is still going on uh, today, with the inevitable outcome of destruction of the, the global fiat currency system. Fiat meaning that it's a money system that's not backed by any commodity like gold, as it was in 1971. So, this is the uh, this is the reality of what's going on right now. Uh, people are becoming aware of this. It hasn't been reflected really in uh, consumer price inflation, but we can certainly see how asset prices around the world, can, uh, specifically the stock markets, global stock markets, have um, all been rising in response to this uh, uh, this inflated uh, supply of money. Uh, so we can now look at some countries. If you go look at uh, Venezuela, of course, Venezuela has uh, very high inflation. It's now at, uh, just 741 percent. But there are many countries that are, are you know, consider considerably um, higher than they should be. If we just look at these uh, countries here, these are the top countries right now that are hyperinflating. So we seriously have a problem uh, uh, in terms of the, the supply of money. Uh, that is one of the issues. But there is another issue. Um, with, when it comes to cross-border remittances, uh, Africa, in fact, has some of the highest costs to move money. If I was in South Africa and I wanted to send um, money to my neighbors, Botswana, Mozambique, Malawi, uh, I'm going to have to pay 28%. Um, and we can see that uh, from Tanzania to Rwanda, uh, Japan to China, France to China, um, very, very high costs of remittance. Um, and uh, this is also a, a big problem right now with the money system we have today, where just moving money from your own country, from the poorest countries on earth, uh, they're having to pay so much. So again, we see hyperinflation, uh, which has an inevitable consequence of destruction of the currency. We see these very high costs to move money. Um, it's very inconvenient. In fact, in my own country, we often see 
people moving money across border in, in suitcases and it's very insecure and uh, very very um, unsafe um, and very often they get uh, the money gets confiscated uh, so we see these problems, but uh, that's just the sort of tip of the iceberg in terms of a global financial system that just seems to not be able to uh, cater in the same way that the, the internet and technology has been developing. We have this archaic financial system with, with great costs and great inconvenience. And there's a number of other issues that uh, we have as well. Um, you might not be aware that there could be such a thing as negative interest rates, but uh, many countries now are you know, trying to lower their interest rates so much uh, because of uh, very uh, slow moving economies that we now have this, this, this phenomenon of, no, of negative interest rates. So if you have money in the bank, you're not, certainly not going to earn any interest from that. Um, other, other issues are um, the, the, the war on cash, the bank bail-ins. We know that some banks now in Europe are, have legislated uh, bank bail-ins. So which means that if you, if the bank starts to uh, have, uh, we could get into trouble, then what they can do is they can actually take money out of deposited accounts. There's this war on cash, which was uh, most uh, um, obvious recently in India when they demonetized the high value notes and it caused a lot of chaos. People had to now um, go and, and exchange notes. And the whole point of this is to drive people into the digital banking system. You know, and, and this is a very complicated, very difficult thing to do. Because uh, most people, the digital divide in India is is vast and it's uh, uh, very co very complicated there. But you know, uh, as banks and and central banks would love there to be no physical cash, because if you have digital cash and the only way you can transact is which is through the banking system, well then that means every single transaction can have a fee attached and also um, every uh, um, amount, every balance can be controlled. So uh, it really is a um, quite a terrible thing in terms of uh, privacy and then there's capital controls we know that uh, countries like china have problems moving money out um we mentioned that the, the there's 80 percent of africans are unbanked but uh, many people are unbanked around the world there's so much geopolitical uncertainty and risk you know we see now uh, that north korea has uh, you know has, has there's threats on north korea from the u.s uh, we see the Middle East has a lot of complications still. It's ongoing. It feels like World War Three is around the corner. Um, and then just a general lack of trust in the, in the financial system itself. So there are so many reasons right now to feel very insecure in terms of this, this financial system as it stands. And in fact, you know, it's, it, if you go back in history, you realize that uh, financial systems don't last forever. And this one, that particular one we've been uh, on since 1971, since the world went off the gold standard, it is an experiment. And um, it just it doesn't seem that uh, those Nobel Prize winning economists that are advising uh, governments and central banks maybe have a hold on uh, what's, what's going on. Now, when it comes to Africa, uh, Africa is an amazing continent because um, there's that, the, the phenomenon of leapfrogging, uh, where you know people have uh, access to uh, new technology and specifically mobile devices. And in fact, um, in my own country and in countries around Southern Africa and Zimbabwe and Mozambique and Botswana, Mobile money is uh, is uh, so widespread that uh, it's actually there, there's more money moving through the mobile money system than uh, through the banking system, um, and uh, because of that, people are very uh, used to the idea of having a, a digital currency, um, but one that's not not attached to the banking system. Now, uh, if you ever visit uh, one of these countries, you'll probably notice that there are all these these QR codes that appear everywhere when you want to make payments for something. There's a, a, a well-known company in South Africa called Snapscan, and just about every retailer, every restaurant has this, this uh, QR code that you can now go and, and scan with your mobile device, and uh, you can make payments. So mobile money, it's becoming pervasive, and more and more people are becoming used to it. Um, in fact, you know, we have a lot of people who are self-employed, um, earn very little money. Uh, they they are um, on the streets and they're doing odd jobs here and there. And in fact, they are even signing up to these services. So you could actually now go and um, if you were to go to a shop, uh, you'd outside there would be somebody who would look after your car and you can go and scan their little QR code and make microtransaction payments to them. Here's another example of of uh, something you'll find on the streets uh, you know, in, in South Africa. 
Um, so uh, you can see how people are very used to this idea of mobile money and and um, mobile payments. And so they don't trust the banking system. It's complicated uh, and the fees are, are onerous. And uh, so now if we were to present something like a Bitcoin, a Bitcoin technology, um, it would be, in fact, so easy for them to consider this as a valid form of payments. It's just a, a natural uh, thing uh, now. And if we look at statistics, we realize that South Africans and, and uh, other African countries are becoming the, the countries that are, um, um, have, are showing most interest. This is just a Google Trends uh, chart which shows interest in, in, in Bitcoin. And you can see how Nigeria, Ghana, and South Africa are the top in the top five countries in the world who have the greatest interest in, in something like Bitcoin. So this is the, the reality of it. You know, people have lost faith in the system and in fact didn't have access to it in many respects in the first place. And um, a, a currency like Bitcoin, it's not that they have to now consider this new idea about what makes something money. It just is a natural thing that they're going to start adopting. And um, uh, we can see it already uh, in terms of uh, interest in South Africa. South Africa, in fact, has one of the highest volumes of um, Bitcoin trading and Bitcoin interest. So it's it's very interesting uh, how this is going to impact the economy. Um, you know, I work with uh, the our own reserve bank. We we are we are building products and services around this, helping Africans to access uh, Bitcoin. Our stated goal is to bring Bitcoin to Africa, but right now it is quite complicated. If the only way to purchase it is via an online exchange. So uh, what we're trying to do is create very uh, basic products like voucher systems um, and payment systems uh, which revolve around these cryptocurrencies. And um, we're very excited about the potential and so are uh, the, the, the people that we interact with. Um, you know, our own currency in uh, South African Rand is uh, has its own volatility, its own issues. And um, I think what's going to happen is that um, eventually people are just going to skip the local fiat currencies entirely and move directly into Bitcoin payments, especially since right now Bitcoin, um, because of its its um, uh, people are, are are appreciating that it you know, the value is appreciating and and uh, wanting to move them their money into it. Uh, I think we're going to start seeing a massive wave as these these products that make it uh, easy for people to use. You're going to see the growth really happen in Africa. Of course, Bitcoin has its own problems. You know, it's, it's a, a community-led product a project with no de facto leader, so it is quite difficult to to um, uh, move it along. Uh, and we're starting to see how communities are becoming divided, and and new versions of the currency are being created. But that's just a healthy uh, thing about the the system. You know, where um, you know if you want to move it in a certain direction, you you have that ability. So we're going to certainly see the free market play a role here in how these technologies develop. And um, the most amazing thing is that it, it's decentralized. And so that's where the trust comes in. You know, it's, uh, people don't feel like they need to trust some organization because trust in organizations and central authorities is, is um, thin at best and, uh, and waning. So this is the, 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 the exciting uh, time that we have now in, in Africa. And um, we're going to start seeing uh, a, lot of, a lot of growth. Um, and there's a lot of potential there. Um, also, I wanted to just uh, uh, highlight another interesting thing about these currencies where, uh, sure, we could have uh, uh, payments uh, and so on, but what happens when you start talking about a decentralized currency and peer-to-peer -peer payments specifically, you start realizing that a lot of businesses that exist in the world today, essentially what they provide is their, their value proposition really is as a glorified payment hub. Now, now what do I mean by that? Um, if we just look at a very innovative, interesting company that's uh, certainly changing uh, uh, how people travel around, uh, the company Uber, um, what we have in, in an Uber situation is we have passengers and uh, drivers. And uh, Uber sure provides an app, but uh, you know, Uber isn't an app. Uh, apps are easy to create. Uh, what Uber provides is a trusted way for passengers to be able to make payments to their drivers. Um, and also Uber provides uh, other services like uh, vetting perhaps and insurance and that sort of thing. But if you were to be able to have a, a payment system that is peer-to-peer, uh, -peer, 
then you don't really need to have a central company uh, to mediate those payments and act as an intermediary. What you could do is you could allow customers, uh, passengers, to directly pay their drivers. And uh, what you could do is you could now disintermediate Uber entirely. Now, of course, you'd still want service providers uh, as satellites who are providing insurance, perhaps, and betting services and that sort of thing. But you don't really need an Uber. Now, if you think about a lot of businesses, if you think about uh, the sharing economy specifically, like Airbnb, um, you know, uh, peer-to-peer payments are going to ha- have a, quite an impact on those business models. And it's not just EB, uh, um, Airbnb. If you think about marketplaces like eBay, you know, eBay again offers a, a central place where people can can buy and sell, and eBay offers security and trust in terms of payments. But if you can now pay your uh, your service providers directly, and you can have these external service providers providing all the the features that eBay were providing in terms of vetting the the merchants and vetting the customers, again, you don't need to have uh, eBay at all. So what's going to happen now, this is going to be the trend, that businesses, are, what we're going to be seeing is that businesses are going to be providing their services in a direct way, in a peer-to-peer way, because a peer-to-peer payment system takes a lot of the problems that come with accepting credit cards and uh, the chargebacks and frauds that are around that. So we're going to start seeing a lot of decentralized services start being created and uh, the business models of companies like eBay and um, uh, even uh, cloud storage and, and those sorts of services like Google Drive and Dropbox, you know, um, we have now have the ability to to um, mesh and and, uh, and and collect unused capacity in terms of storage or, or CPU or processing power, allow people to to Airbnb, if you like, your hard drive. Uh, and charge microtransaction, micropayments in a peer-to-peer way. So there's going to be very interesting uh, disruption in terms of a lot of the, the industry and a lot of the businesses that we take for granted just because of this ability now to make peer-to-peer payments. And then another uh, uh, use case that is close to my heart, I've been involved in a, in a social project where what we do is we allow uh, foreign donors to make direct payments for energy at needy African schools where we can now disintermediate the donor organization. And donor organizations act in the same way as, as um, intermediaries and other business. You know, you, they charge fees and, um, you know, and also they distribute payments uh, opaquely. Um, and sometimes there's corruption, what we call a leaky bucket. So if you can now pay your uh, or donate to that directly for to that cause that you believe in, uh, it's very possible to be able to disintermediate actual organizations that uh, take quite a lot of uh, a big cut of the payments that are made by donors. And uh, uh, what's nice about that is that uh, you can now reach what's called the long tail of uh, charitable donations. The long tail is a is a was popularized by Chris Anderson. He wrote a book called The Long Tail, and he talked about how. There are a few number of products or services that have most of the the customers. If you think about social networks, there's Facebook and search engines, there's Google, um, and the other products that are very uh, popular, um, and they take most of the market share. And then you have a, a many number of products or services that have very small market share. Well, that works in the same way for for donors, uh, organizations, or at least causes that we believe in. There are very few number of causes out there that eventually have received most of the funding. And there are many, many, many causes out there that receive little to no funding. Well, if we, again, if you have a peer-to-peer payment system, you can then directly fund those causes you believe in without having to go through an intermediary that then will divert those funds in whatever way they think is is important. Um, so this is the just a kind of snapshot on how uh, currencies like Bitcoin, these what are called cryptocurrencies, these decentralized currencies, are going to make a big impact on the world in terms of existing business models, but also in terms of how people can actually now pay and earn uh, through uh, peer-to-peer payments, making these microtransactions. Very, a, a very interesting uh, phenomenon. And also one that we shouldn't disregard. A, a lot of people will say, well, you know, these cryptocurrencies, they, they, there's nothing backing them. But um, you have to remember that money, you know, there's been all sorts of kinds of money throughout history. You know, uh, there's been seashells and salts and um, a whole number of things. And, um, you know, when we look at that, we realize that it's not what money is that makes it money. It's what it does. And, um, again, Bitcoin has all the, the, the ingredients for a very good and useful form of money. And that's what makes something valuable. It's, it's usefulness and it's scarcity. 
And um, we see how Bitcoin has those properties like gold. It's uh, very scarce and it's a good medium of exchange. It's durable and divisible and fungible and so on. And so uh, we certainly are looking at a, a, a unique time in history, something that uh, where technology again has surprised us. You know, at first we have our skepticism and doubt about a new technology, but eventually it fills our lives and we, we look back and realize you know, after a few years, how could we live uh, without it? And uh, cryptocurrencies are no different. So anyway, I want to just end now uh, on that. Um, what we have again is we have a, 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 this, this, this unique crowdfunding platform which we are, are putting together. Uh, what we are allowing foreign donors to do is directly fund uh, the energy needs of these little needy African schools and hospitals. Um, we're extending that to be able to now have uh, investors uh, install renewable uh, power supply like solar panels and then donors can actually go and uh, afford to um, can donate and fund those renewables and eventually allow those uh, little schools to become energy independent. But um, thank you. I'd like to thank you for uh, listening to this. Um, I hope it's inspired you. There's a lot of interesting things around this and I'm sure that you would find it very fulfilling if you uh, pursue it into the future. Thank you. Inspiring indeed. Thank you so much, Lorian, for sharing your expert knowledge with us today. And thank you also to all those who tuned in. And uh, if you want to find out more, please uh, check out Lorian's contact details, which could be found at the beginning of this presentation, as well as the description box below. And uh, if you want to continue the discussion, why don't you check out ConnectingAfrica.com for all your latest news and industry developments, as well as at ConnectAfrica on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And join us in Cape Town on the 20th anniversary of AfricaCom between the 7th and the 9th of November. It's three days of content, 400 speakers, and 450 exhibitors over two exhibition halls. We're mapping Africa's journey through the fourth industrial revolution. So you can even attend the exhibition and a wide selection of talks and presentations for free by signing up for the AfricaCom Visitor Pass. See you again next time for another Digital Week webinar. Thanks. Goodbye. Okay, we're done.